Hello everyone and welcome to Misha's True Crime. Today we'll be discussing the Franklin Delano Floyd case. If you guys would like to learn more about this case after I finish talking about it, you can go on to the beautiful A Beautiful Child by Matt Burbeck. He wrote a beautiful book about this case and it really is amazing. And I think even this I think this book actually helped uh with some of the people like put the police officers on the case i'm not sure if that's true but let's begin so franklin delano floyd was 16 when he broke into a sears department store in inglewood california this was his first time ever committing a burglary uh, well a crime that was his first crime ever and you're probably wondering like mm, okay he broke into a sears not that big of a deal but, you know, he did come from, like, a very poor family. He was the youngest of five children. Both his parents did have problems. Uh, his mother left him. Well, she didn't really left him. She was forced to give him up because she, you know, she couldn't really make a living of herself. So she, she had to give him up to her husband, who was an alcoholic, and he died from kidney and liver fever. So they were put into a children's home, and he was bullied by other kids. And it was later reported that he was sodomized, although we don't know if that's really true. It was reported, I allegedly, let's just say that. Um, it, it also in this home that, like, whenever, as a punishment, whenever he would be caught masturbating, they would, like, dip his hand into, like, hot, boiling water. But, yeah, um, he often got in trouble for fighting and stealing. And in 1959, the children's home put Floyd into custody of his sister, Dorothy, after he ran away and broke into a nearby house to steal food. Foster homes. I love them. Um, okay. So after he was kicked out of his sister's home, because he was a very troubled kid. He was, like, very troubled. Uh, so he, this was about when he was, like, so I would say like 16, 17. So he was underage. Um, he went looking for his mom. Uh, and she he found out she had become a prostitute. This barter bothered him. Like I don't I think he watched his mom like doing her job and he hated it so much. Like it messed with him. And later she helped him forge documents to go to um california to enlist in the army but he was underage and when they found this out he was from he was kicked out i think that's what they say but yeah uh when he was 16 like i said he broke into the series department that was his first crime he at this point he had a gun like he wanted he went into the department to steal a gun and he got shot but he survived, got surgery, survived, was it sent to a youth institution, and again, was arrested for violating his parole. He was, he did a lot. Like, he was arrested a lot, he did a lot. But I think, because he was underage, it didn't really affect him. But he was convicted, convicted of kidnapping a child molestation, was sent to serve 10 to 20 years at the Georgia State Prison in Reedsville. Um, so, he was in jail, but he was moved to Milledgeville State Hospital for psychiatric testing. So, they thought there was something wrong with him, and when they were taking him, he escaped. He, like, got away, and he, like, when he got away, he robbed about six thousand dollars from a branch of citizens in southern national bank he robbed a bank six thousand and he got caught and he was sentenced to a uh, federal reformity in ohio after a second escape attempt he was transferred to united states penitentiary in lewisburg pennsylvania and i'm not sure i don't want to say this is real but when he, his second escape, he he got like he convinced I think his cellmate, and they like got out and they stole a car, or 
the jeep things i don't know what they call them sorry but he's they like stole one of those and they tried to like hit it into the gate but the gate like broke down so it didn't work out for them yeah that's what <laughs> so like he kept trying to do this and it wasn't like working out so they got they got caught again because it's like what could it do I feel like the officers who had to get him were just probably watching them trying to like start the car and just like mm -hmm, yeah keep going mm -hmm. we'll just watch from here what are you gonna do so yeah uh that was the second time after this he he was continuously um sexually assaulted by other inmates and he tried to commit suicide after that he was sent sent to a federal penitentiary 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 in illinois and then he was sent back to georgia state prison and befriended a fellow inmate named david dow um so in 1972 of november he was released from prison and sent to a halfway house what is a halfway house i'm going to look it out up i don't know what it is halfway house oh okay it's a institute for people with criminal backgrounds or drug abuse tendencies to learn or relearn the necessary skills to reintegrate into society and better support and take care of themselves so basically uh rehab for criminals i guess um after he was released from the halfway house, he approached a woman at a gas station and forced her into a car where he attempted to grope and sexually assault her. The woman managed to escape and Floyd was arrested. Again. Floyd convinced Dal, who had also been released from prison, to post his bond, allowing him to go to run as a fugitive. When he failed up to short for, for court on July, June 11th, sorry, 1973, a warrant was issued for his arrest. And that is Floyd's story. Yeah crazy so he was on the run for a while and while he was on a run in 1974 he got he had the alias of brandon williams and when he was brandon williams he had met a woman named sandy chipman at a truck stop in north carolina now this is where our story starts this is where it gets crazy so i'm just like chipman was the mother of four children from two different fathers suzanne from her husband Cliff Savakis and Allison, Amy, and Philip. Okay, from her second husband. Dennis Bradenberg, Floyd, and Chipman dated for a month and married. And Floyd convinced Chipman to move her family with him to Dallas, Texas. Okay. Let's see what's going weird. Chipman was sentenced to 30 days in jail for passing bad checks in 1975. When she served her time, she left her, her children in the custody of Floyd. At the time, Brandon Williams. After she was released, she arrived home to find a residence vacated and her husband and children gone. Chipman eventually found her two middle daughters, Allison and Amy, in the care of a local church-operated social services group. She never found her oldest child, Suzanne, or her youngest child, Philip. The boys' whereabouts remain unknown until 2019, when a woman, when a man came forward believing he was Philip. DNA tests confirmed his identity. According to his sister, older sister Allison, their mother had first claimed Philip was dead. She later learned from social services that he was alive and that he had been privately adopted in North Carolina shortly after he was born. So, I guess the mother to, you know, help them with the pain and instead of, like, keeping them, like, worrying about Philip and stuff, she just said he was dead. But I do think that the mother, of course, was looking for her children because why would she not? They were her children. Now, we're going to meet... Tanya Hughes. And if you remember, Suzanne never found out about her. She's been missing. All right, we got that. Suzanne, only one we don't know about. By 1989, Floyd, his second wife, Tanya Dawn Hughes, who um, had her infant son, Michael, were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Hughes worked as a dancer at a strip club. 
a fellow dancer, Karen Parsley, encouraged Hughes to leave the domi- domineering Floyd only for Hughes to claim that he would kill her and the child if she tried. Floyd had gained the, joined the fraternal order of police to stop, despite not being a cop and has told Hughes that he could use his tr- connections to track her down. However, by April 1990, Hughes had decided to run away with Kevin Brown, a college student she was having a secret relationship with, and take Michael with her. So I'm going to go more in detail with this. Um, when Tanya Don Hughes was working at the strip club, Karen Parsley and the rest of um, her co-workers were trying to help her out and get like out of the situation because they saw like at the end of the night, when Tanya would go into the car with Floyd, he would like she would immediately give him the money. And if she I'm not super sure, if she didn't make I think two hundred dollars by the end of the night, he would beat her. Like she'd come the next time with bruises all over her. And she would work every day. Like most strippers choose not to work every day because it is like something that's mentally um tolling but she worked every day and if she didn't make two hundred dollars by the night every night she would get in trouble and she would end up with bruises and they all knew where the bruises were coming from they knew floyd was beating her um so one day she met kevin brown she fell in love with him and had a whole elaborate plan to take michael away kevin was like listen i got money i can do this i can take care of you just come with me um, that same month, when she was about to run away, three passerbys found Hughes lying on the side of the highway 100 miles outside of Oklahoma City. She was rushed to Presbyterian Hospital in Oklahoma City with severe bruises and a large her- hematoma at the base of her skull. She subsequently died. As she was found with groceries scattered around her, Police surmised she had been struck from behind in a hit and run while walking from a convenience store to a nearby Motel 6. When Floyd arrived at the hospital the following day, he claimed he had fallen asleep at the Motel 6 after Hughes had departed to to collect the groceries. Also, when she was in the hospital, he wrote on a note that she was not allowed to have any visitors. Like, he, he asked for a pen and, like, a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, he was just, like, no visitors. And just, like, put it on the door. Weird. The nurses, everyone found this weird. Um, during that time, Karen Parsley and the rest of her um, co-workers did come to visit her. And when they saw that, they thought it was really weird. And they explained to the police, like, hey... Uh, like, we think it was this guy, we think it was Floyd, we saw that he was abusing her, we saw that he was doing all kinds of stuff. Listen, we think it's him, we know it's him, and she has a son, and her son's named Michael. So, of course, um, the nurse relayed this information to the police, but because there was no evidence that it was Floyd, they couldn't really say anything about that, but they did look for Michael. Um, and following the death of Hughes, Floyd put two-year-old Michael into foster care and left the state. Michael's foster parents told authorities the boy had limited muscle control, was nonverbal, and often experienced hysterical behavior when he was first arrived at their home, but he had made remarkable progress. In 1994, they began adoption proceedings. So, Floyd took Michael and was missing for a while. And then we found out that he put him in foster care. And, you know, he got a new family. The family said that he had all types of problems. Like, he was, he was, like, at an age where he should be able to do things on his own. Like, drink his, like, milk, I think, on his own and stuff. And then six months after Michael was placed in foster care, Floyd was arrested on parole violation. As part of the adoption process, Michael's DNA was compared to Floyd's to establish paternity. It was discovered at that time that Floyd was not Michael's biological father. When Floyd was released from jail, he attempted to regain custody of Michael on the basis of his criminal record and discovered that he had no biological relation. His request was denied. He was not able to get the kid back. Now, this is where Michael Anthony Hughes... Um, 
Tanya Donahue's son was kidnapped because Floyd was angry that he could not get his son back. He kidnapped Michael. So on September 12, 1994, Michael was in the first grade, first grade, I'm sorry, at Indian Meriden Elementary School in Chukata, Oklahoma. I hope I said that right. <clears throat> Floyd walked into the school and forced Principal James Davis at gunpoint to take him to Michael's classroom. Floyd then forced Michael and Davis into his pickup truck. Floyd f forced Davis out of the truck in a wooded area, handcuffed him to a tree, and sped off with Michael. The, princi the principal survived the abduction and was rescued. Michael was not. Two months later, Floyd was arrested in Louisville, Kentucky. Michael was not with him and has not been since. They were still looking for Michael. They did not know where he was. Floyd wouldn't say nobody knew where Michael was and they were looking for him for crazy for like crazy because this was a little kid and they understood that they had to find him in a amount of time or he could die before he could kill him authorities have received conflicting reports as to what had has, has happened to michael because they thought that floyd because they knew that floyd saw michael as his son he they thought that they had at least 70 hours 78 hours to save the kid um some witness statements detail alleged confessions by Floyd regarding Michael's death. According to these reports, Floyd reportedly told his sister and others that he had drowned the child in a motel bathtub in Georgia shortly after the kidnapping. Another person claimed he saw Floyd um, bury Michael's body in a cemetery. Other, still other resources reported that Floyd had stated Michael was still safe and alive, although Matt Floyd had refused to disclose the boy's exact location or who was caring for him. In a 2015 interview with the FBI, Floyd admitted to killing Michael the same day of the kidnapping by shooting him, shooting him twice in the back of the head. Michael is dead. Um, yeah, all that work to look for him and he was already gone. Um, so when looking for Michael and Floyd, they found Floyd's truck and under Floyd's truck, they saw pictures of a little girl in promiscuous um, positions and she, they could tell by looking at her she was young and she was wearing lingerie I think she would it's, it was child porn and it was always the same little girl now we're going on to Tanya Hughes the investigation into the death of Tanya Hughes and the kidnapping of Michael uncovered more unsolved mysteries. So Tanya Hughes, if you remember, she was Michael Anthony Hughes' mom, and she was the one who died. Um, so because of the death and the kidnapping, they were a bit confused and they were looking more into it. It was discovered that Floyd had raised Tanya Hughes as his daughter since her early childhood. DNA, DNA testing to determine her paternity uncovered she was not Floyd's biological daughter. Floyd has given a number of inconsistent statements regarding how she came to be in his custody. One such story is that he rescued Hughes when she was abandoned by her biological parents. The earliest known record of Hughes was her elementary school registration in an Oklahoma City school in 1975. She was registered under the alias Suzanne Davis. Authorities suspected that she was born in late 1960s and kidnapped by Floyd sometime between 1973 and 1975. Now we're going to go into Suzanne. Suzanne Marie C Davis. Suzanne Davis. Suzanne Davis was a a student a super smart student she was dreaming of becoming a working for NASA NASA she was she earned a full scholarship to Georgia Institute of Technology she was going to study aerospace engineering super smart very intelligent and she um, made a friend so her friend and her met at a 
this like camp but it wasn't really a camp it was more like a seminar thing for a few days and i think it was i don't remember what it was about but they, that's where they met and this is where okay so a friend was named jennifer jennifer and jennifer was this young kid who was like super excited to be there and they were both the same age they were both freshmen and everything so you know they were when they met and they like started to talk they realized that they had a lot in common and they wanted to be best friends so the entire time they talked and it was like they've known each other for years but in reality they did um so jennifer uh she realized that there was some stuff off with like suzanne because whenever suzanne would um which at first when she asked suzanne for her number suzanne said no even though they were good friends and they wanted to keep talking she suzanne told jennifer she could not give out her number she jennifer of course was confused and later on jennifer found her number and contacted suzanne and she could hear like suzanne's dad in the background very angry about this so jennifer and suzanne um after this incident with the father it was okay they got over it they kept talking and they had sleepovers um usually suzanne would go to jennifer's house and jennifer's parents were very nice people they had a little money and Floyd realized this. So Floyd would try to convince them to give him money because he painted the, um, painted the story that he was a single father raising his daughter after his daughter, his wife, sorry, died in like a car crash. Bit odd. Um, but truthfully, that's not what was going on. One day, Jennifer went to Suzanne's house for a sleepover. This was, like, the first time they switched. And when she was over at Suzanne's house, she realized something was, like, really off. Um, Floyd, I'm sorry, Floyd would ask them, do you want to go to dancing do you want to go dancing and then of course they were excited they said yes they were like oh my god we're gonna do big girl stuff we're gonna go dancing so they dressed up they were wearing skirts everything and um jennifer was like i don't really have anything to wear to this like to go dancing do you have anything and suzanne showed her like her closet and everything and in suzanne's drawers were lingerie and when Jennifer asked about this, she was like, Suzanne, like, Jennifer was like, why do you have so much lingerie? And Suzanne was like, oh, my dad buys them for me. Red flag for me, but I guess Jennifer was like, oh, okay. They were young, they didn't really know. So she was like, oh, okay. They went dancing, they enjoyed, and they went back. And yeah, so Jennifer ended up going back home. They still kept in contact, still had sleepovers. But I wanted to mention this. Because Jennifer, later on, helps out a lot with this case. Um, she, even though uh, Sharon was super smart, Suzanne was super, um, super smart. Uh, she did not, she even graduated, but she did not end up going to Georgia Institute of Technology, even with her school scholarship, because her dad didn't want her to and she got pregnant she got pregnant and um they moved they didn't i think they did keep in contact with jennifer there was even a point in time where she would visit jennifer's family and asked them to adopt her and take her but jennifer's parents couldn't unless they, she said something to them about what was going on be, on her home but Suzanne didn't and so they couldn't do anything but they wanted to help they knew something was wrong and they wanted to take her home and help but they couldn't because she didn't say anything um so she ended up moving to Tampa Florida with Floyd and she gave birth to her son and that is where Miss Sharon Marshall 
turned into Tanya Hughes and gave birth to Michael Hughes and that's where she became a dancer that's where everything happened now she had three different aliases and police weren't able to put everything together until like way after everything happened until like they didn't figure out that Floyd killed Michael until like 2015 so this is like Suzanne was sexually assaulted when she was little um she was raised by him she was killed by him although they couldn't prove that but allegedly it is a bit suspicious that she was run over when she was planning on escaping with her son to with someone else um jennifer realized that this was her friend and contacted like like she tried everything to contact her and you know she contacted um suzanne's mom where she i think she was one who told suzanne what was going on uh also um suzanne's friend karen parsley also kept looking for her so both karen and jennifer were looking for her everywhere but she was never found she died michael was dead all that was left was floyd um, so Floyd admitted to the murder in 2014 and that he disposed of the body on Interstate, Interstate 35. The police searched for it, but they couldn't find it and they believed the wild hogs may have eaten his body. Uh, in 2001, while awaiting tri trial for Comessa's murder, Judge Nancy Lay ruled that Floyd was incompetent to stand trial and ordered for him to go under further mental evaluation. Floyd fought against the assessment, asserting that he was compliment, competent. Sorry. Several months later, the judge reversed her previous ruling and ordered him to stand trial. He was convicted and sentenced to death. Yep. Uh, in all, all of his Floyd's alliances, Warren Judson Marshall, Brian, Brandon Cleo Williams, Clarence Marcus Hughes, Trenton Davis, Preston Morgan, Kingfish Floyd. He kidnapped Sharon Marshall. I mean, she died. Um, he murdered Cheryl Ann Camesso. Cheryl Ann was... Um, she was known as Jane Doe for a long time until they figured out who she was. But yeah. So that's in all three people that he murdered. And he was sentenced to death. Thank God. Um, sadly, this story was really messed up. I first heard it on the Mango podcast, Mango True Crime podcast on Spotify, and was really interested in the way it was told. But if you guys would like mo more, check out A Beautiful Child um, by Matt Burbeck. He goes into full detail of everything, and it was an amazing book. Thank you.